Aloha, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, for those of us who can see us, thank you for joining us. A lot of people signed up today. I didn't plan this, but I'm, I'm wearing the same shirt that's in the advertisement for this panel. It was, it was not something I expected. It's also the same shirt I wore this morning on Hawaii News Now. So I have more one than one shirt in my wardrobe. I want you to know about that. Um, I, think, I think it looks pretty good though, right? It's, it's silver beet orange. Um, it's so interesting to be doing this via Zoom. I mean, here we are 19 months into this pandemic and I have participated like many of you with many of these um, book and film festivals, book and uh, other festivals in the past, of course they're in person and they wouldn't necessarily be recorded. And it is interesting to have this one recorded and have it archived so that everybody else can benefit from it. It also makes you a little nervous because you're being recorded and you're like, oh no, what am I gonna say? It's a little bit different from being uh, in a live audience or rather an in-person audience because we are live. Well, you know, I'm the politics and opinion editor at Civil Beat, just briefly. Civil Beat's been around for 11, 12 years. You probably know Piero Midiar uh, founded it. Of course, uh, founder of eBay. He lives here with his family. Uh, and we are a nonprofit. Started out as a for-profit, moved into the nonprofit realm when we found that being for-profit on the internet was a challenge. We're doing pretty darn well. I am surprised, frankly, that we're still going strong. We're even expanding. And it's really a delight on a personal note and a professional note to have a job in this very challenging environment, not only with journalism, but with everything that's been going on lately with the economy and the pandemic. Thanks, Chad. Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, anyway, uh, thanks uh, for, you know, hosting this and Roger and the Book and Music Festival and everybody. So this is, uh, it's a really interesting event. And, um, I think it's a great way to connect the community. So I, I started uh, Oceanit uh, 36 years ago, I suppose. I uh, got my PhD at UH, and uh, the choices were sort of work at Pearl Harbor or teach at the university, so I started Oceanit. And um, we're a mind-to-market company, so we think of things and drive it to market. And um, we employ a few hundred people, maybe 100 plus PhD scientists and engineers. Uh, we're in uh, energy, healthcare, defense. Uh, what we're doing some interesting industrial technology as well. Uh, we, we just did a Kickstarter on a, a cooling vest using a nanothermal polymer that keeps you cool. So it's for those industrial applications and recreational applications. So uh, we've, we've kind of created a process uh, and uh, I'm not going to go through all the, the details, but there's a book out, I uh, got it uh, re uh, released last year called Intellectual Anarchy. And uh, it's how we think from the middle of the sea. But we discovered that it's really a metaphor for a lot of the country. So uh, last week, two weeks ago, I was talking at an event on the mainland. Uh, we had 100 and I think 12 universities and um, including a bunch of university presidents. So we had the new president of the University of California system, plus a bunch of others. And it was really about rethinking the, um, what they do in graduate education and the industrial workforce. And they were very interested in the kind of things that we do. And there's some real specific things we can do to support um, creating a more diverse economy. Case in point, you know, with, with this rapid test, we examined the opportunity of manufacturing in the state of Hawaii because we invented the technology. We can build it here. You know, field forward edge manufactured technology for medicine, that's where the future is going. Um, kind of interesting. We created a, uh, a tool set with DARPA. Uh, DARPA underwrote the mRNA work from Moderna and uh, federal government supported a lot of the work with, uh, with Pfizer, BioNTech. I mean, the world's changing really fast and geography isn't really the issue, but there are things we can do to address that. Um, in my opinion, you know, you've got sort of three main ingredients when you really take geography off the table. You've got energy, you've got broadband and transportation. So I think we could create a policy around affordable energy for companies in a manufacturing tech space, charge the hotels a little more and charge companies a little less. 
Um, you know, broadband, I won't even start on that, but as you can imagine, it's a real frustration. It's something that's addressable. It's a lack of, uh, I think, will to really make it happen. And transportation, uh, I mean, we're connected to the planet, but there's no question most of the, the contiguous states have uh, highways that connect them. We don't. But we could put together uh, special pricing for transporting goods and other things around businesses. Um, there's all kinds of flexibility, I think, in being able to do that. You've got the Interstate Commerce Act, a lot of other things at the federal level, the state level, plus the things we do with um, you know, the airlines and others. So I'm an optimist. I think there's a lot of opportunity as well. The world is changing under our feet. It's a real exciting time to be doing this stuff. So I think uh, Hawaii's got a great future, but I think we got to learn to work together. So I can go on, but at that I'm going to I'm going to stop and and uh, and manage my time and give everybody else a chance to talk. Thanks. Thank thank you, Patrick. I, I do have one or two questions for you. By the way, it is encouraging to know that getting a PhD at UH uh, can lead to steady employment uh, in Hawaii. <laughs> so very good. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We're recruiting as fast as they can mint them out of the uh, university. There are a lot, I mean, certain programs, it's like we wait for them to kind of finish their PhDs. And it's kind of like we got standing offers from the physics program and engineering and a bunch of others. I mean, we can't get them fast enough. And they do some really good education at University of Hawaii. I think it's an under, it's an underappreciated and probably the single most important institution in the state of Hawaii. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, this started in 2020 uh, and really launched in December of 2020. And it was created by what I call my board of volunteer CEOs. They, they basically saw tourism uh, collapse during COVID. And they, they thought about exploring a different type of visitor, like a more socially responsible one, um, you know, a remote worker who could stay longer. And I think also noticed that remote work allowed a lot of local kids to come home, you know, and work for that period of time. Um, and, you know, that's a, a very uh, popular um, idea that's like very near and dear to you, to the hearts of Kama'aina, right? Being able to bring family back home. So there is this really interesting opportunity created by COVID uh, which allowed people to move around and not really choose their their place to live based on where they work. Um, and so that was last year um, when we had a shortage of visitors. And you know, as we came back to the world temporarily, uh, we then came back to our kind of more normal problem, which is having too many visitors. Um, remote work was evolving as well. And so, um, we were trying to figure out how do we kind of take what we've built um, and and pivot, you know, and kind of continue to evolve with the times. Um, and, you know, what we realized was that we had built this program that was able to really immerse people in Hawaii, uh, really help them learn and contribute and connect uh, to our community. And, you know, then thinking about with this core asset, what do we do with that? Um, and I think we've really kind of shifted our focus a bit from thinking about a different type of tourist or a different type of visitor to more about talent and how that um, talent has more fle geographic flexibility now. And so what does that mean for Hawaii and um, being able to access that talent, you know, ideally if they move here, but also there's a lot of economic ties that can be had um, if people like uh, stay on stay on the continent, you know, come here, build those ties, and and go back. So, um, as I mentioned at the end of our pilot uh, in the spring, we realized that we we had built this program about people and relationships. And in fact, um, you know, I, I work uh, sometimes with Stephen and and Carl Bonham at New Hero, and when I explained the program, Carl kind of uh, said, "Hey, it sounds like." you're building an accelerator for interpersonal relationships. And in fact, that is exact, I was a social psychology major at Yale. So it's not surprising that I, you know, love to think about how you bring people together um, with, within their environment as well and the connection to the land here. And so there are three kind of major components to the, the program. It's learn, contribute and connect. So basically in learn, educating people um, about you know, the local culture, history, um, current events, so that they're prepared to speak the same language in a way, or at least um, come to an understanding with 
local residents here and can actually build uh, relationships and really helping to facilitate that connection. Um, I always talk about this piece of trying to give something that's more than reading the back of a zero box, but less than a semester at UH um, and really trying to give a, an, a diversity of authentic voices and let people decide for themselves as well. Um, contribute, this is really probably the hallmark of the program. Um, participants will spend about uh, two months, 15 hours per month in teams of five for the second cohort. Um, and one person on every team of five will be a local resident. And what we're really trying to do is one, tackle bigger challenges in, in team projects, but also um, create deeper bonds when people are tackling a challenge together and having that um, diversity and cross-pollination um, really lead to hopefully innovation um, and a lot of uh, collaboration. And, you know, if I think about what we're trying to do um, in that accelerator for interpersonal relationships, we're also trying to remove those perceived boundaries be between what makes someone a local or born and raised Kama'aina or Chad, like you've been here forever, you know, like um, I myself hold a lot of those biases, I think. And so really thinking about how do we remove them? Because then, you know, amazing things can happen um, when, when we remove those kind of different differences or perceived differences. Uh, and then lastly, about connecting within the cohort itself um, and with the land and the local community and uh, professional network as well. And so uh, one thing I'll call out here, you know, we noticed that um, housing was the number one pain point that came up about our program, even though it was a really small program and you know, really try to understand what our impact is. Um, and it was also the number one pain point for remote workers coming here of finding you know, reasonably priced um, short, shorter term housing for rental. Um, so in the next cohort, we're actually uh, have a partnership with Waikiki Malia by Outriggers so we can build an Olympic village um, where cohort fellows are invited to, um, to stay at a, at a discount. So we don't subsidize it, um, but we highly encourage it because it then you know, keeps everyone together and also kind of uh, reduces our impact um, even with small numbers on the, on the local rental um, market. And so, yeah, we're always trying to think about different ways that we can uh, bring people together. And you know, anyone who has traveled before um, knows there's a really strong expat community in, in different places. And uh, it's sometimes very difficult um, to interact with local populations because on both sides right there's there's kind of uh different motivations for being there and local residents as well are really busy you know and um it's like why would i invest my time in someone who's here even for a year and so uh i was very intentional in in trying to bring local residents into this program as well and really build those personal ties so that we can reduce the economic distance as, as Stephen likes to say um to to the continent um, and a lot can happen, uh, even though there is a lot of distance. A couple examples of that, we've had um, a cohort fellow, uh, Teddy Liao, who's the CEO of NextRef, a remote call center. We connected him with DBED, um, and he's one of the two initial uh, remote work companies. Um, and we're hoping to have about 100 to 200 remote jobs created for Hawaii residents. Uh, we also had Charlie Salas, who's one of um, our cohort fellows working with Waipahu High School. He works for Exelon, a cybersecurity company based in DC. He went back and created two paid remote work internships in cybersecurity this past summer for uh, two Waipahu High School students. Plans to expand that to four. Um, actually, Sway Van Lee and uh, Tsibo Beek wrote a really nice article about it. Um, so what we really see is that if we can build the relationships, then the magic happens afterwards and it continues onwards. And that's, that's really the goal as well. Um, our work's been recognized numerous times at a national and international level. Uh, we've created programs that are award-winning, and we're really deeply passionate about uh, inclusivity, diversity, and really kind of looking at how might we create uh, work that lives beyond uh, when we're involved, right? And so how can it be in a, a sort of that abundance mindset? Um, so for, we've been doing this work here in Hawaii for a little bit over a decade. Um, we are one of the few firms, if 
that invests 100% into local businesses and entrepreneurs. And regardless of whether we're leading the initiatives or we're involved with initiatives, we look at ways that we can multiply that impact, as I mentioned before. And so at the end of the day, like we invest in human capital. Like as an investor, you hear time and time again, ideas are a dime a dozen, right? Products, services, whatever it is, those are, you come across that a lot, right? But as an investor, what you're really investing in is people in that team, that team that can actually execute on that idea, that team can implement it, that, that team that can create a positive impact. And so through all the work that we do, we're really focused on the human capital aspect of it, right? Really working to educate and elevate local entrepreneurs and businesses. And so it's kind of a nice segue into uh, some of the work that like where our heart has been for the last uh, year and a half. So when COVID hit the entire business community, we're all on calls trying to figure out what can we do? What do we need to do, right? Uh, we know perhaps at some point that there's this federal money that's going to come in called, called the CARES Act, um, but maybe we're not really sure about how to deploy it, how to make sure that it effectuates the type of change that we wanna see here in our local ecosystem. And so as a result of that, I was asked to, to, to look at innovative ways to create um, an architecture that could meet all of these different needs, right? The workforce development needs, the business development needs, and of course, the economic diversification needs. And so with that sort of innovation and entrepreneurial mindset, I helped create or I architected this framework that then was um, really trying to help answer the question of how might we use this time, right? This COVID time, the funding that's coming in as an opportunity to invest in ourselves, right? In the community, in the people, using it as an opportunity to, to help all of those that all of our organizations are, are trying to serve. And how can we do it so that it has the, the broadest uh, stroke in terms of like touch, right? Uh, not to serve the privileged few, but to really try to serve the masses across all of the islands. And that's, that's a tall order, right? Because um, we know usually in, in times like a pandemic, it's the underserved uh, and the underrepresented that are affected the most. And so that was top of mind for all of us that were working to create this, this program. And so the program ended up getting um, approval from the ledge for about $36 million. Um, eventually $10 million was deployed via sort of um, two tracks. And I'm, I'm very excited about the two tracks because one of them is very near and dear to, well, I'd like to think both of them are very near and dear to all of our hearts, right? One was focused on Ina. Uh, because that holds a very special place in all of our hearts, like conservation, the agricultural uh, sustainability aspects, et cetera. And then the other was emerging industries with this very much like, what are the jobs of tomorrow going to look like? Um, and so Kupu was um, contracted to administer the, the INA and conservation part, because that is definitely one of their specialties. And then Ida, the Economic Development Alliance of Hawaii, was contracted contracted to do the emerging industries and innovation side. At the end of the day, almost a thousand people were um, placed in jobs, right? That allowed them to learn new skill sets, to get reskilled, upskilled and cross-skilled in jobs that were the jobs of tomorrow, not the jobs of yesterday, right? And so for, for many, it was their first opportunity to, since the hospitality and tur tourism industry had shut down, it was their first opportunity to really kind of explore other, other types of jobs, other sectors. I mean, we heard countless, countless stories of how this one individual was interested in learning gaming, but never thought that there was a pathway or an opportunity to explore that. Another was really interested in the digital and, and graphical aspects of cultural storytelling, right? Uh, and so all of these, pro this, this entire initiative allowed that sort of opportunity to exist. Now, what was really important to me personally was that this was centered in Aloha, right? And it was built on connecting as humans, right? Not as industries, not as sectors, but really connecting as humans. And then also to really help elevate and align with existing initiatives, not to dilute anything that had already been um, done here in Hawaii. And so we aligned it with the Aloha Plus Challenge by Hawaii Green Growth, which again, that's another type of globally recognized framework uh, based on the UN SDGs. Um, 
the program, I can't even call it a program because what we wanted is we wanted it to, to live beyond the short period of time that we had to deploy the money. For anyone that was involved in CARES Act funding, uh, we all know that when it first came down, we had a very brief period to deploy it, right? And so we wanted to create what is, will be a long lasting sort of pathway. When we went back and we, we surveyed um, on both tracks, the, the uh, experience of the participants, right? What we learned is many of them permanently sort of switched gears, right? They, they continued on in those sectors. They continued, some of them, a large portion of them actually continued with the, with the companies that they were placed with. And so in the nuts and bolts of it, this was a, this was a framework that was designed to pay individuals a, 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 a wage, provide them with healthcare benefits for the entire time that they were with uh, the initiatives, and then also provided funding for the different companies that were creating that space for these individuals to get cross-skilled, upskilled, and reskilled. So clarifying what the goal of diversification is. Um, in the first case, there's, there's a whole lot of benefits to specializing, but the problem with specialization is obviously that you that all your eggs up end up in one basket. And so when a shock hits the economy like a pandemic, um, it really hurts. And so diversification offers um, a way to reduce risk. And all diversification also offers new opportunities for growth. And so any diversification, diversification strategy has got to balance these two things, the benefits of specialization, but also the, the opportunities for growth and, and reducing risk. Um, for an investor, reducing risk and diversifying is a whole lot easier than it is for a state or for, for a place. A state can't diversify across locations because it is a location. The state can't choose the range of activities. The people that live there choose those. And, those, and the people, the locals benefit from doing particular things together. And this is because there's lots of connections between people and between different parts of the economy that all depend on each other. Different industries need different capabilities. They need different types of supports, different types of institutions, different skills. And for a small state, it'll be poorer if it tries to do everything. But there are certain benefits from doing particular activities together. And this needs to be, this need for certain activities to be done together actually really highlights the difficulty of geography. And this is where I'm gonna disagree with Patrick. So if we look at patents per 1,000 scientists and engineers, and we rank here, I rank all the states by patents per 1,000 scientists, not only does Hawaii first have fewer scientists and engineers than other states, in part because it's isolated, and so a lot of scientists and engineers or potential scientists and engineers leave or don't come here in the first place. Of the ones that remain, they also produce fewer patents per engineer than 48 other states. And this is partly related to Hawaii's isolation and partly related to diversification. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so this balance of diversification and specialization and geography suggests to look for industries that are different, but are related to the existing activities that we already do here that make use of the same skills, the infrastructure, the capabilities that are used already in the visitor industry in Hawaii, or any other expertise or characteristics that are really unique to Hawaii. These are new industries that might be subject to different demand fluctuations and characteristics, but they give, they give the benefits of diversification but they build off the benefits of scale for productivity. And this is what I talked about in my You Hero Brief, which down here on the screen, uh, location, 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 you can find it on our website. Now, I've been learning as much as I can about the Hawaii economy since I arrived. And I've been reading this book, The Price of Paradise. And it seems the idea of diversifying into related industries is not really very new at all. The very first chapter of this book describes exactly that, diversifying into related industries. And this book was written back in 1992, but it reads today just as relevant as it would have back in 1992, if not more so. So targeting related industries makes sense, but how do you know what the related opportunities are? Now you can have a few good guesses and a few of these are made in this book and these things were done. They built a convention center, they expanded business and conference travel to diversify the visitor base for the year. And business visitors that have slightly different demand characteristics than tourists, especially to add demand, say, outside of some of the peak summer period. But they make use of the same capabilities, such as hotels and amenities that are used by tourists. But once these more sort of obvious ideas are done, what else can Hawaii do? 
it's really important that this uses really deep local knowledge to identify what those opportunities are. You can't have some outsider like myself saying that Hawaii should do this. I, I don't know those answers. And if I was to come and say that Hawaii was gonna do that, people are just gonna push, push back against that. The problem is that when you ask people, when you ask everyday people, the things that, that people like, the ideas that they have are also full of all of their own personal biases. These can be little pet projects that they think are exciting or something that they have a financial interest in or a professional connection or any other sort of internal bias. Industry policies, this is where policies target particular industries. These are often failed in the past because they're favored at politicians or a donor's special interest and have tried to save a dying industry for too long. And so we need to use more objective ways for identifying opportunities for diversification that we can then have a government policy to support. Now there's been decades of research done since this book looking at how economies grow and diversify. And it's also tended very much towards this concept of related industries. The research treats industries or products as a complex system of activities. And by sharing, by analyzing which products are frequently done together and within the same firms or within the same places, it implies connections between those products. And this generates a network of connections. So the particular network I've shown on the screen here describes all of the products that are exported in the world. The research on exports finds that if particular pairs of exports are frequently exported together, then it makes them a lot more likely to emerge in places that currently just do one or the other. So this means that economies tend to grow and diversify by growing along the branches of this network. So we can look at this network and see what, what products Hawaii is good at exporting and see what opportunities branch out from those. Those become the what to diversify. It's also best to move towards products that are in the center, this really dense core network, because these tend to provide many more opportunities for growth. These industries are described as having a high level of economic complexity, which is shown to support income growth. And we need to modify the analysis a bit to accommodate tourism, which isn't included in the standards of trade analysis, as well as non-traded activities and all of the knowledge and, and assets and capabilities that are built into those. These techniques can also be applied to firms or to regions, to individual islands, or even to suburbs, or to looking at patents and innovation to see what the different diversification opportunities are. So this sort of analysis provides a really strong objective indication of the diversification possibilities. They would generate a list of products or industries that are currently not in Hawaii, or are currently very weak, but are industries that we would expect could exist here because of Hawaii's other strengths. It would generate development opportunities for lagging regions so we can make sure that all of Hawaii's residents can benefit. One of the next steps though is to figure out why those activities don't yet exist here. And this involves a really deep dive into each of these industries to find out what's going on and what it is about Hawaii that has prevented that industry from emerging already on its own. And for this, I re recommend borrowing some ideas from the European Union Smart Specialization Policy. Smart Specialization is one that accepts that regions will tend to specialize in a particular thing that they're really good at, and it will prioritize it, but then diversify into related areas to support growth. Regions support R&D, entrepreneurship and commercialization activities within prioritized domains. It's not, particularly, it's not picking particular winning firms or ideas, but reflecting on the economy and highlighting areas and domains of strength and opportunity. A really important element of the approach though is that it gets community support by being a bottom-up process. A successful approach does not have an outsider like myself telling you what to do. Locals determine the vision for the future, what they want diversification to look like. They have a really deep knowledge of the economy of specific industries and how those operate here in Hawaii and why they don't yet exist or what the barriers are. And locals can also incorporate local values and culture. This allows the strategy to be tailored to local conditions and generates local support rather than being imposed top down by government. So by analyzing the strengths and opportunities in Hawaii in relation to this network of industries, this provides an input to creating this local vision for Hawaii. And it digs into the local knowledge of Kama'aina, of local businesses, universities and communities to find out why the opportunities haven't yet grown in Hawaii and if there's anything holding them back.